This meeting is now being recorded. Thank you for joining us for Metabolon's half-hour webinar series where our topic today is understanding lipids at the molecular level with lipidomic analysis. We will have a short period of time for Q&A at the end of this webinar. Please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A section at the upper right of your screen. And just a quick reminder that this webinar will be recorded. Thank you. Your presenter for today is Dr. Lisa Franklin. Dr. Franklin holds an undergraduate degree, summa cum laude in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale University and a PhD in chemical biology from Harvard University. As a Hope Fund for Cancer Research postdoctoral fellow in David M. Sabatini's lab at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Lisa focused on novel me metabolic alterations that enable the growth and spread of cancer cells. She also played a key role in establishing the Whitehead's metabolite profiling core facility, which she then directed for several years. During this time, Lisa developed several metabolomic and lipidomic profiling techniques and contributed to over 20 peer-reviewed publications. In December 2016, Lisa joined Metabolon as a senior research scientist responsible for research and development in the area of lipidomics. I'll be turning the presentation over to Dr. Franklin now. Good morning, and thank you for attending this webinar. During the course of today's presentation, I'll first give you a brief introduction to the basics of complex lipid structure, as well as the unique challenges that this introduces for lipidomic profiling and the requirements for a successful lipidomic analysis. I'll then go into detail about Metabolon's complex lipid panel, or CLP, and describe how the technology behind the panel allows us to meet the key lipidomic challenges. Finally, I'll describe a case study in which this technology was applied uh, to a very interesting set of biological samples. To begin, I'm sure it's no surprise to this audience um, that lipids play a really wide variety of important biological roles. Most of us are familiar with the role of lipids in nutrient storage in the form of fat. And indeed, triacylglycerols and also sterols play an important role in metabolic diseases, including fatty liver and cardiovascular disease. However, other lipids play important structural roles where they modulate membrane properties and as such can influence receptor signaling, subcellular localization of membrane proteins, cellular level processes such as endo and exocytosis, post polarity migration, as well as barriers at the level of the whole organism, such as the skin and mucous membrane. Other lipids can play signaling roles at both the cellular and organismal level. Given this vast diversity of, of biological roles, uh, it therefore isn't surprising that complex lipids also fall into vast diversity of chemical structures. Fatty acids are the basic building block of most complex lipids. Glycerolipids consist of one or more free fatty acids conjugated to a glycerol backbone. In the, and in the case of glycerophospholipids, the lipid is further decorated by one of a wide range of highly polar head groups such as, for example, phosphocholine. Sphingolipids utilize an alternative backbone called sphingosine and a variety of additional fatty acid conjugates, such as cholesterol esters and cardiolipins, further contribute to the diversity and complexity of a lipidome. The large number of possible lipid structures leads to a basic problem in lipidomics, which is that many lipids share the same chemical formula and therefore have identical exact masses. This means that they cannot be distinguished by a single mass spectrometric measurement. This issue can affect lipids both within a single lipid class as well as lipids across different lipid classes and therefore very different functions potentially, as shown by these three examples. Compounding this issue is the fact that unlike isomers in small molecule metabolomics, many of these lipid isomers are not readily separated by chromatography. And furthermore, many standards may not even be commercially available. Another key difference between polar metabolomics and lipidomics is that lipids have a modular structure. To see what I mean, let's examine this particular lipid structure in detail. 
As you can see, it has a glycerol backbone and a phosphocholine head group, which together define it as a phosphatidylcholine lipid. And it also possesses two fatty acid side chains, one consisting of 16 carbons with no double bonds, and one consisting of 18 carbons with a single double bond. Together, these features define lipid as phosphatidylcholine 16-0-18-1. Because most complex lipids similarly consist of a head group and one or more fatty acids, we can actually think of the lipidome as a matrix, with each lipid contributing both to a column corresponding to its lipid class and one or more rows corresponding to its fatty acid composition. Importantly, measurement of, a, um, measurement of different lipids within a single class does not necessarily represent independent measurement, because multiple members of a single lipid class can often be made or degraded by the same enzyme. Therefore, the total concentration of a lipid class, which is represented by the sum of a column, can be as if not more important and informative than the concentration of any individual species. Similarly, a particular fatty acid can be incorporated across many lipid classes, and therefore the total concentration of a fatty acid across many lipid classes corresponding to the sum of a row can also be an important marker of the metabolic status of the system. To provide accurate data on lipid classes and fatty acids, as well as individual lipid species, though, a uh, lipidomic profiling method must meet several criteria. The first of these is specificity. That is, the lipidomic analysis must identify the fatty acid constituents of each lipid. A common shortfall of many lipidomic profiling methods is that they provide only the sum composition of a lipid, for example, PC34-1, instead of resolving the two individual fatty acids of the lipid. However, in this uh, scenario, uh, or this type of analysis, does not allow the fatty acid composition of the lipid to be identified. Secondly, a successful lipidomic profiling strategy must be quantitative. In other words, it must provide the molar concentration of each lipid species. Uh, the method that only provides relative abundance of every lipid does not allow accurate summing either across a lipid class or across a fatty acid. Finally, a lipidomic profiling method must have broad coverage uh, because a partially completed matrix would not accurately represent the contribution of a given lipid class or a given fatty acid. At Metabolon, our solution to these challenges is our complex lipid panel, or CLP. It is based on the commercially available lipidizer platform, which was developed by AB, which was co-developed with AB Science. And the platform consists of several analytical steps that together permit the routine and confident identification and quantitation of hundreds of lipids. Lipid-containing lipid solutions are directly infused into the ionization source of a QTRAP 5500 mass spectrometer. Upon ionization, the lipids pass through a selexion differential mobility separation cell. A differential mobility separation is a process in which a voltages are applied that selectively permit the passage of only a specific lipid class at any given time. This minimizes the overlap between isomeric species across different lipid classes that I mentioned a few slides ago. After the DMS-based filtering, lipids enter the multiple reaction monitoring, or MRM, phase of the analysis, in which both the intact mass of the lipid and the mass of a characteristic fragment are measured, permitting the identification of the fatty acid side chain or side chains of the lipid. For example, for the lipid that we looked at previously, the differential mobility separation would conclusively identify it as a phosphatidylcholine. The intact mass would give us the sum composition, PC341. And the fragmentation would allow us to assign the specific identity of the lipid as phosphatidylcholine 16.0.18.1. To allow for quantitative analysis, of Metabolon's complex lipid panel includes more than 50 isotopically labeled internal standards that are introduced into each biological sample um, early during the extraction process. At least one internal standard is present for every lipid class, and many of the larger lipid classes, such as the phosphatidylcholine, actually include multiple internal standards to account for differences in ionization between lipids in a single lipid class. Intensity data are collected for um, both the internal standards and the endogenous lipids, and after that, this formula is used to calculate the molar concentration of each endogenous lipid in the starting biological material. 
Finally, the, the complex with the panel provides broad coverage of over 1,100 typical mammalian lipids. Um, at least 800 of these are de de routinely detected in human plasma. Importantly, uh, this broad coverage is provided without sacrificing the speed of the analysis, which is another common shortfall of comprehensive broad coverage of the pedomic profiling method. Now that I've introduced you to the basics of lipidomic profiling and the specifics of comp the complex lipid panel at Tabalon, I'd like to go into a case example in which the CLP was used to analyze human plasma samples. Um, in this study, which was conducted by Carson Zur and Hannah Lohr Daniel at the Technical University of Munich and Weill Cornell College of Medicine in Qatar, 15 young, healthy male volunteers were subjected to a highly controlled four-day challenge protocol, including fasting, uh, oral glucose and lipid challenges, physical exercise, and cold stress. And here's a detailed schematic of the entire experiment. You'll note that um, each arrow represents a plasma sample collection, and a subset of these plasma samples uh, were analyzed on the complex lipid panel. One of the first things that we noticed when analyzing data was the incredible degree of individual-to-individual individual variability. Here this is exemplified by the micromolar concentration of total triacylglycerols across the donors. And you can easily see that the lowest concentrations for this orange donor are pretty close to the highest concentrations for some of the other donors. And the ability to analyze and faithfully record this type of individual heterogeneity is one of the great strengths of a quantitative lipidomic profiling platform. However, for purposes of comparing across subjects and discerning trends over time that hold for all of them, uh, we found it useful to mean scale the data, the data um, which means that each subject's concentrations were scaled to that person's overall mean. At that point, the data from different subjects could be combined, uh, and clear time-dependent trends could be uh, extracted. If we overlay the various challenges across this time-dependent trace, uh, we can see a wide variety of biological responses in the triacylglycerol concentrations to the various challenges. So let's look first at three of the challenges, all of which involved energy intake in some form. The liquid diet, the oral glucose challenge test, and the lipid-rich meal. And it's, you can very clearly see that under the lipid-rich meal, total triacylglycerol concentrations increased by a factor of about twofold, uh, whereas under oral glucose and the liquid diet, changes were uh, less significant. However, uh, recall that this total triacylglycerol concentration measurement is actually the sum total of over 500 individual triacylglycerol species measurements. So in analyzing the data, we can go far beyond the total measurement and examine, for example, the fatty acid composition of each uh, and each individual. And this is done by summing uh, those triacylglycerols that contain a particular fatty acid. Uh, when we do this, uh, for example, for oleic acid, fatty acid 181, uh, we can see that um, under the lipid-rich meal and to a lesser extent under liquid diet, uh, the proportion uh, for the percent contribution of oleic acid to the total triacylglycerols increased, whereas um, during the oral glucose challenge test, there was no change at all. And this is very reasonable because, because while the oral glucose challenge test involved no lipid intake, uh, the lipid-rich meal, for example, actually consisted of a great deal of oleic acid in the form of rapeseed and sunflower oil. And this type of data basically tells us both the kinetics and the extent to which lipid intake is reflected in the plasma lipidome. Now let's look at three of the other challenges, all of which involved energy expenditure. Fasting, exercise, and cold stress, which involved the subject putting their hand into a bowl of cold water <coughs> for a specified period of time. And we can see that triacylglycerol concentrations dropped during each of these challenges. However, when we look at fatty acid composition, there was no change in any of the three challenges. And this makes sense because uh, it reflects the idea that triacylglycerol concentrations are being used or taken out of circulation without regard to their fatty acid composition. So, so far I've only discussed the triacylglycerol uh, concentrations, and you may be wondering what happened to the other lipids uh, in these subjects during all of the challenges. And in fact, there were relatively few ch changes in the other complex lipids uh, during these relatively short-term perturbations. 
However, when we looked at the free fatty acid concentrations, we saw a number of interesting trends, many of which actually uh, were the mirror image of the triacylglycerol trend. So for example, during fasting, triacylglycerol concentrations went down, whereas free fatty acid concentrations went up. And this makes sense because when energy expenditure is high, uh, triacylglycerols are taken out of storage, broken down to their constituent free fatty acids, which are then utilized for energy through the process of free fatty acid oxidation. And this is quantified on this slide. You can see how under fasting and exercise, uh, there is a significant drop in triacylglycerol concentrations and a concomitant increase in free fatty acids. However, you don't actually get three equivalents of free fatty acid for every equivalent of triacylglycerol, as you might expect, because, in fact, the free fatty acids are being used up uh, and oxidized for fuel. And you can also see that, by contrast, under the cold stress condition, triacylglycerols went down, but there was no concomitant increase in free fatty acids suggesting that perhaps the triacylglycerols were being removed from circulation but not actually being utilized. Uh, and this suggests what most of us probably already know, that unfortunately stress is not a substitute for diet and exercise. I hope that this case study has convinced you that in addition to looking at individual lipid species, quantitative data on lipid classes and fatty acid compositions can provide really valuable insight into the biological status of an organism or other biological system. However, as I've described, um, in order to obtain this kind of data, a lipidomic profiling platform must meet several requirements, including specificity of lipid identification down to the fatty acid composition level, quantitation um, to the level of micromolar concentrations, and broad coverage. And finally, as I've described to you, Metabolon's complex lipid panel provides high throughput quantitative lipidomic data that fulfills these requirements uh, in a manner that is consistent with the analysis of large subject cohorts. Now I'd like to take my, I would like to thank my colleagues at Metabolon who contributed to the development and operation of the complex lipid panel and also um, the researchers at the Technical University of Munich and Weill Cornell College of Medicine in Qatar who performed the human subject experiment. And I'll now take some of the audience questions. The first question um, asks whether we utilize antioxidants in our lipid sample preparation. Um, and the answer is that no, we do not utilize antioxidants. Part of the reason is that our um, profiling platform is a flow injection analysis. And therefore, uh, high concentrations of any additives, such as antioxidants, um, have the concern of potentially causing signal suppression and leading, leading us to lose sensitivity for our lipid handling. The second question uh, is regarding sample handling and recommended sample handling conditions uh, for lipidomic profiling. Um, now the answer to this varies somewhat depending on the sample matrix, um, but the overall theme is as cold as possible, as soon as possible. So for example, for um, human samples, plasma or serum, um, it's important that the plasma or serum be processed within an hour and uh, frozen in minus 80 degrees shortly thereafter uh, because uh, lipid degradation can occur even in four degrees. Uh, so in general, as, as a general rule, we would caution against extended room temperature or four degree incubation and repeated freeze thaw um, as the possible confounders of lipidomic analysis. The next question um, asks, uh, how do we validate our data, or how do we validate our platform? Um, this is an excellent question, um, basically asking, how do we know that the concentrations that our uh, panel is reading out are accurate? Um, and there's a few levels of validation that the panel has um, undergone. Uh, one of them has to do with a uh, predecessor technology that was based on TLC, thin layer chromatography separation of lipid classes followed by GCMS-based quantitation. Um, and this orthogonal panel, uh, this orthogonal platform, um, as well as our newer flow injection mass spec-based panel, gave very similar results for a cohort of uh, human plasma samples that were analyzed uh, in both ways. And this was one of the key pieces of validation um, that, we, that were done when our panel was first put in place. Um, also, of course, comparison with literature values 
and analysis of standard samples, such as a NIST plasma, um, are important uh, pieces of validation. Although it must be said that uh, only very limited uh, literature data are available that have the same degree of coverage and identification of um, lipids as our panel. And so we're certainly looking forward to having more data coming out that will allow us to uh, compare across uh, platforms and verify the accuracy of data. Um, because of the lack of availability of commercial standards for many of these lipids, um, traditional validation can be a challenge. Um, the next question asks, um, can you describe the platform in detail of whether you, and whether you perform any targeted, untargeted analysis and any GCMS-based analysis? Um, so I'll go in order. Um, the platform that we use, uh, the basic instrumentation is a ABCI XQTRAP 5500 instrument equipped with a select cyan differential mobility separation cell. Uh, there's no liquid chromatography. The samples are introduced by flow injection. Um, and because of the nature of that instrumentation, it is a targeted analysis. We don't currently perform any untargeted analysis because of the additional challenges of lipid identification as well as the difficulty of accurately quantifying lipids uh, without having uh, matched internal standards, uh, which can only be done with a predefined list analyte. Uh, finally, there is um, no G routine GCMS component of the complex lipid panel as of now. Uh, GCMS is extremely helpful for separating isomeric fatty acids, for example, um, cis versus trans, uh, branched versus straight chain fatty acids. However, GCMS cannot report on the complex lipid origin of those fatty acids. So clients who are very interested either in um, isomeric non-esterified fatty acids or total fatty acids um, can work with our targeted assay team in-house to obtain those additional measurements on their samples. And that can sometimes be a very useful complement to um, the complex lipid panel. The last question asks, what is the most exciting application um, that you're aware of for this technology? Um, that's a great question. And one of the great pleasures of working on the complex with the panel has been to see the wide, incredibly wide scope of applications that our clients have uh, used it for. Um, as I've mentioned, we have analyzed a number of large um, human cohorts. Um, of course, a number of them have had a connection to metabolic disease. Uh, but also other conditions um, as diverse as post-traumatic stress disorder, um, testing of various foods, the effects of various foods and exercise, um, and basically looking for biomarkers. I basically think that lipidomics is, is in many ways uncharted territory and, and much remains to be learned. And so I'm very pleased to see uh, the application of lipidomics in this wide range of areas. As well, we've worked on a number of studies of tissue from model organisms um, representing a wide range of diseases uh, such as cancer and liver disease um, and cell culture studies in a wide range of applications as well, including nervous system tissue, uh, bioprocessing studies, and so on. Okay, that seems to be it for right now. So thank you everyone for attending our webinar. If you haven't received an answer to your question, we will get back to you shortly with an answer. In case you'd like to share the replay or listen again, the recording will soon be available on our website. Um, we do have some upcoming webinars coming up um, that are on the last slide. If you, if you want to attend any of those, those can also be registered on our website. Um, Thank you again. Have a great day. Bye.